Mr. George Casey Jr. George Casey Jr. is living proof an individual's past is not always an accurate predictor of his future. He is the epitome of the saying, your future endeavors do not have to be dictated by your past indiscretion. A lack of drive and ambition marred Mr. Casey's life as a teen and young adult. His high school and college years passed as unrecognizable blurs due to his immature attitude and inability to focus. During this time, his main objective was on the life of the party and not on his education. His reckless and irresponsible behavior eventually led to him becoming homeless and ultimately to an incident where he was held at gunpoint. This all occurred prior to his 22nd birthday. It was only after a gut-wrenching, eye-opening conversation with a family member that Mr. Casey realized there was more to life than having a good time and being the life of the party. Despite the conversation and his own realization, Mr. Casey had no goals or aspirations for his life at that time. Divine intervention led him to enlist in the United States Marine Corps. Finally, while serving in the Marines, Mr. Casey developed a new confidence, focus, and purpose while instilling discipline and fostering his leadership skills. His ability and willingness to quickly adapt to military life led to several awards and accommodations from his superior officers. In addition to giving Mr. Casey a sense of professionalism and accomplishment, the military allowed him the opportunity to build his relationship with God, metamorphosizing him into a truly inspired and highly motivated being with a new outlook on life. After having been honorably discharged in 2000, Mr. Casey was motivated to enroll in the University of Phoenix, where he received a bachelor's degree in business management. His completion of his college education culminated in his obtaining employment at CSX Transportation. During his career at CSX, Mr. Casey has taken advantage of various de development plans, both personal and professional in nature. It was during his participation in a mentoring program that he was encouraged to join Toastmasters. As he has navigated the waters of Toastmasters, Mr. Casey has spoken, made visits, competed, encouraged, motivated, empowered, challenged, and served others. His desire to compel others to reach their fullest potential and beyond has captivated and inspired audiences throughout the Southeast region of the United States. Mr. Casey is very aware that many individuals struggle with the idea that they can change their reality by changing their mindset. His strength lies in his ability to convey the evolving but consistent relationship between thought and action. His very life is the blueprint for talking the talk and walking the walk. He believes it is divine, it is his divine mission to challenge himself as well as others to better your best. And now, without further ado, it is my distinct honor to bring forth to you <laughs> Mr. George Casey Jr. Y'all know there's such thing as two-a-days. 
In two a days, that's when they really try to kill you. You know, you go in there and practice all day hard, take a little break, and come back and practice hard again. But this day, we were on our second practice. And we were doing what was called up-down. Anybody know what up-downs are? <laughs> I, I, I'll explain to those that don't know what up-downs are. It's basically when you run in place oh. until the coach will, will blow the whistle. Now, when the coach blows the whistle, you got to hit the ground and jump back up and start running in place again. Now, this particular day, I couldn't, I, I stopped counting. I couldn't tell you how many eagle flops, or we call them eagle flops at the time. I, I couldn't tell you how many up downs we did. We did, we did so many up downs, I couldn't even feel my legs anymore. I could barely probably tell you who my name was. I couldn't feel my arms. And in my mind, I already began to think about quitting. I said in my mind, I already had a goal in my mind that I was only going to be able to do five more up-downs until I quit. So as I went through these five more, that's all I could think about. How many more I can do until I quit? So I did five more, four more, three more. At this point, I was barely picking myself off the ground. I couldn't wait to get to that one. And if the, if the coach hadn't stopped us, I knew in my mind I was going to quit. So we got down to two, and then one. I already had it in my mind that after this last one, I was going to quit. And guess what I did? I quit. I walked right off the field. The coach was, Casey, where you going? Coach, I quit. That's too much for the birds, coach. And I walked off the field. And we had a little hill that led out, out, to the, out to the outside of the gate. And I found my seat right outside that gate. And I watched the people that were practicing. And it was only a few more minutes until the practice had wound down. And eventually it was over. <coughs> I said, dang. That's where I was at. Only a couple more. In fact, I saw a teammate later on and said, Casey, what were you doing? What were you thinking? We only did a couple more. And then practice was over. He told me that the coach intended to do that that day. He intended to do as many eagle flops as it took, as many up downs as it took, to find out who didn't have it in them. And guess who that person is that didn't have it in them? You. Or did I? Because in my mind, I had already had that I was going to quit after one more. But seeing that practice had wound down just a little bit later, I knew in my heart I could have did a couple more. I could have finished. I could have completed, and I could have made the team. But I didn't have it here, and I didn't have it here. <coughs> and see, what happens when you quit one time, it's almost easier to quit two times. And it's so much easier to quit three times. And before you know it, you're a quitter. You become known as a quitter. Whatever you think about most becomes what you are. Thoughts become things. You always have to remember that. Thoughts become things. In my mind, I thought about quitting. I thought long and hard about, well, maybe not too long, but I thought about quitting. And that's exactly what I did. And like I said, from that point on, it was so much easier for me to quit in everything I did. When I graduated high school, the, whole, the only thing I was, I, was, I was impressed with was partying. That's the only thing that I was, I graduated, when I graduated, they had what's called uh, superlatives. Y'all know anybody know what class superlatives are? I was voted. I was, I was given two things. I was, I was voted most popular, which is a struggle to be popular, but I was also voted class clown. And my teacher came to me that day. She said, Casey, I can only give you one of those. Anybody, can, can anybody imagine which one they gave me? Class clown. All I was worried about was having a good time. Not, and now that goes on my record. And when I, when I look at my yearbook, 
And I, and I think about how I could have been listed as the most popular. Instead, I look at a class clown. That's who I became, a class clown. And when I graduated, I didn't have any direction. I didn't have any idea what I was going to do. I didn't have any idea what I was going to become. Once considered most popular, once considered class clown, I didn't have a plan of what I was going to do. I didn't have a plan of what I was going to be. And what I became was homeless. Party after party after party. I, I partied one summer so hard that I got evicted three times. I got evicted once and moved to the next street. I got evicted again and moved across the street. Evicted one more time and moved down the street. And after I got evicted that last time, nobody would rent to me anymore because I was considered, there you go, class clown. What you think about most is what you're going to become. Thoughts become things. You know, while I was homeless, it led me to uh, Savannah, Georgia, or right outside Savannah, Hinesville, Georgia. Anybody know where Hinesville, Georgia is? I, I lived in Hinesville, Georgia for about two months homeless. And I had a cousin there at the time. My cousin sat me down, and she asked me something that would change my, for the rest of my life. She said, George, and she looked at me. And until this day, nobody had ever looked at me like this before. And I knew she was serious. And she looked at me. She said, George, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your life? <coughs> I really didn't have an answer. I really didn't have a plan. But I remember a couple of my friends talking about joining the United States Marine Corps. So I told her, I might do that. I might join the Marine Corps. And she looked at me again, she said, no, that's what you need to do. You need to join the Marine Corps to get some structure in your life. You need to join the Marine Corps to get some structure in your life. Now, until that point, I said, I didn't know that that's what I needed until I landed at Paris Island, South Carolina, where they make United States Marines. And I was forced to find out who I was and what I really had inside me. Now, when you get to Paris Island, they give you what's called an initial strength test. That's just to make sure you can make it. Now, when I got there, I was a failure. I was a quitter. We had to, we had to do what? We had to do pull-ups. We had to do sit-ups. And I had no problem with that. Where I had a problem with, with the run. We had to run a mile and a half in 12 minutes and 30 seconds. I only got through about half of the mile. I only got through about half of the mile until I completely gave up. Because that's what I was used to do. That's what I was used to doing. I was used to quitting. It was easy for me to quit at this time, even at Marine Corps boot camp. So what happened is at that point, they put me in what's called physical conditioning platoon. They're going to make sure you get ready. To all the people that were recruits at that time, we knew PCP not as physical conditioning platoon, but as pork chop platoon. The, the people that were a little bit overweight that couldn't, couldn't quite take it. And we had to stay there until we passed two consecutive runs. But you know what? While I was in there, I started thinking. I couldn't, I couldn't stand to stay that much longer because at that time, that doesn't even count as training. Marine Corps boot camp is 11 weeks long. That don't even count as training. So I knew I had to get out of there. So I made up my mind, just like I made up my mind to quit. I made up my mind that nothing was going to stop me from getting out of there. And I passed the first run, just barely. I think I maybe had like two seconds to spare. But I knew I had one more time to do it. And I knew I couldn't let anything stop me from completing this. Well, one of my recruits that was with me, Recruit Smith, he said, Casey, don't worry, bro. He said, I got you. He said, I never have a problem with the run. I'm real good at the run. My problem is with the sit-ups. 
I can't manage to do those sit-ups, but I can do the run. He said, all you got to do is, is stay with me. And I'm going to guarantee, I'm going to guarantee that you pass this run. I said, okay, cool. So we set out for the run. About a little ways into the run, the guy that told me, I got you, the guy that told me that started to fall back. So I, at, this choice, at this point, I had two choices. I could either fall back with him, but I already had in my mind what I wanted to do. I wanted to pass this. So I pulled a little head from him. And the next day I know I pulled a little head, a little more head from him. And then before I knew it, I looked back and I didn't see him anywhere. A person that guaranteed me, all you gotta do is stick with me and I'll get you through it. You see, that's accountability. You gotta have accountability. Even though this guy told me, I got you, all you gotta do is stick with me. You have to be accountable for your own actions. And see, I learned that early. You gotta be accountable for your own action. Even though he was sticking with me, I knew what I knew in my mind what I had to do. And I pulled ahead and I ended up passing. I talked to him a little bit later. He said, Casey, I don't know what happened. I just wasn't feeling too good. Now see, if I had counted on my friend instead of the counting on myself, I would have been in trouble. I would have still probably been in boot camp to this day. But I had in my mind what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a United States Marine. And they don't just give that title to anybody, I guarantee you that. They don't just give that title to anybody. You have to actually earn that title. And I didn't want him to give it to me. I wanted to earn it. I wanted to say that I was not a failure anymore. I was not going to be a failure anymore. I chose not to be a failure anymore. I knew I had it in me. I knew somewhere inside me that I was already designed for greatness. I knew somewhere inside me that I had greatness in me. And I would listen to the drill instructors. And what got me through it, the drill instructor reminded me as many times as he could. He said, Casey, let me tell you something. He said, pain, pain is only weakness leaving the body. Pain is only weakness leaving the body. And you know what I believe as Romans 12, 2 says, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. You see, with that, I began to transform, not into the regular me, but into the USMC me, the United States Marine Corps me, the hardcore me, the person that's not going to quit, the person who sets my goals, who sets my standards. And I'm going to strive to complete those no matter what it takes. That's the person that I became. I transformed from a person who was a failure to a, from a person who quit. Who, who, who quit every chance he got, I transformed into the United States Marine. Now that's not, an easy, that's not an easy thing to do. And one of the things I had to do in doing, getting there, I had to make sure, because I knew my struggle was running. I knew my struggle was running. So I had to come up with a plan that was gonna help me get there. So you know what I decided to do? I decided to make my drill instructor mad every chance I got. And it, I don't know if you have anybody in the Marines in here, but I'm, I'll assure you, anytime you make a drill instructor mad, it's not going to be a good thing. Every time I made my drill instructor mad, he took me over in the corner. He made me do sit-ups, push-ups, run in place, leg lifts. But I knew I needed that. Mentally, I knew I needed that to get through Marine Corps boot camp. Well, on February 23rd, 1996, I became a United States Marine Corps. I'm mean, a United States Marine. And I'll tell you the best part about that. Anybody know anything about boxing? Anybody know who Riddick Bowe is? Riddick Bowe was the champ, the world champion in 1996. He beat Evander Holyfield for the championship. Well, Riddick Bowe was at Marine Corps boot camp with me. The champ of the world was at United States Marine Corps boot camp with me. But the only difference in, between him and me, I graduated. The champ only lasted three days. I don't say, I'm not saying that he couldn't have made it, 
because all of us know that champions are made way before they go into the ring. So I believe he was a champ way before he came to Paris Island. But mentally, mentally, it was easy for him to quit. Mentally, it was easy for him to quit after only three days. I lasted 13 weeks. <coughs> so with that, I thought that was a, a, a huge accomplishment. So I said, you know, well, what else can I accomplish? So from there, I started setting goals. And see, that's what you have to do. You have to set goals. And every time you achieve a goal, every time you set a goal and you achieve a goal, you get that much more confident in yourself. And nobody can tell you that you're not going to amount to anything but you. You can hear it and you can believe it, but that's up to you to believe it. Because it's all here. And it's all here. And see, we were all, I believe everybody in this room, we're all designed for greatness. We're all going to be great in our own way. If you, if you look at a fish, anybody's ever gone fishing before, and you see a fish on land, that fish is shaking and jumping and bouncing around. But as soon as you put that fish in that water, in its natural environment, it begins to be great. So maybe it's just that you haven't found where you want to go yet. You haven't found that niche yet. You haven't found what you want to do yet. Or maybe some of you have and just don't know how to get there. So it's four steps. And I learned them by using, I, I, I came up with it by using one of Muhammad Ali's greatest of all time, the G-O-A-T, Go. See, Muhammad Ali called himself the greatest of all time. And I believe all of you can be the greatest of all time by doing these four things. The first thing you have to do is set a goal. Again, once you start setting a goal and start achieving goals, you get your confidence. You get more and more confident, and nobody's going to be able to tell you what you can't do. The second thing, you have to know where you want to go. You have to know what you want to do, the outcome. The O is the outcome. So you have to commit to that outcome, no matter what it's going to take. You might have to get in trouble a couple times. You might have to work out. You might have to lose some sweet sleep. You might have to sweat. You're going to have to owe something. Being successful is easy. Or excuse me, it's not easy. Being successful is simple. It's very simple, but it's not easy. Because if it was easy, everyone would do it. So you gotta make sure you have it here. Find your outcome and commit to that outcome no matter what it's gonna take. The next one is A, accountability. It's okay to have an accountability partner, but at the end of the day, accountability is up to you. What you do and what you don't do is up to you. Whether you get to your goal or whether you get to your goal, you don't get to your goal, it's up to you. What you do to get to that goal is up to you. You have to be accountable. And the last thing is T, think. It's the thought process. You have to begin to think like you are the greatest, that you are the greatest of all time. My favorite Muhammad Ali, he used to tell people all the time, I'm the greatest of all time. And he said, he said you know, I, I told people that so many times, they didn't have any choice but to believe him. But somewhere in there, he started to believe himself, the thought process. You have to believe that you are the greatest. You have to believe that you were designed for greatness. Everything that God designs, he designs it for greatness. If you look at the bumblebee, the bee, the bee is designed by scientists, they say the bee is designed in, a, in such a way that it shouldn't be able to support its body with its wings. But guess what? It's made by God. It's designed for greatness. You are made by God. You're designed for greatness. You only have to think. As a man thinking, so is he. You only have to begin to think that you are the greatest, because you are. I truly believe that. It doesn't matter where you start off in life, only how you end. And on how you end, it's all up to you. Nobody else can determine that but you. Now, I'm going to close out. But before I do, I want to leave you with this piece that I wrote myself. And I use it 
and I inspire myself every time because it's easy in life. Once we set out for something, it's easy to forget our passion, to forget our why, and we start worrying about how. How are we going to get there? Well, don't worry about how. Concentrate on the why. Why do you want to get there? Only reason I'm doing motivational speaking, or well, one of the biggest reasons I'm doing motivational speaking, two reasons. One, I want to inspire young kids, young adults, because that's where I was at one time, thought to be a nobody, thought to be a failure, thought to be a quitter. That's where I was at, but that's not where I had to remain, because I began again, as I began to change my thoughts, I began to transform. The second reason, the second reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to buy my mom a house. I want to be able to buy my mom a house. Those are my two whys. Those are the things that keep me going, that keep my passion burning. It's a burning passion inside me that I can't quit even if I wanted to. But I'm gonna leave this, I'm gonna leave you with this last piece and then I'm gonna be out of here. And it goes like this. My mind begins unraveling as I start traveling through time. I shall not fear, for my destiny lies greater than that which is here. Through tunnels of darkness grows light, but it's suppressed by no movement. Motion becomes only a thought as I am brought for a second back to reality. But realness has no meaning, meaning still I am lost get found, bound by the shackles and chains that enslave my brain, leaving me motionless, but yet still standing, demanding more from life than life demands of me, releasing my inhibitions, allowing my soul to be free. You see, free, it's only an idea, but it's been made a promise. And we all know what happened to promises. Promises are made to be broken. And so they break like glass. But like glass, I see through them. No, past them. For past them has no limitations. Past them lies that freedom that remains to be seen. That piece of the American dream. That little piece that calls for peace so I can be at peace. In Brunswick Job Force Center, I pray, I pray that peace be with you. Thank you.